My name is Graziella Fagg. I'm CEO of Foster NZ, the Foundation for Social Responsibility New Zealand, and happy to be in Australia. I've just been telling some people I have an Australian passport and, and hold that quite proudly, although I do support New Zealand in sport. We'll leave it there. Um, I'm just going to give some instruction just in and around how the session will run, much similar to this morning, that each of our panellists will be invited up to introduce themselves in about 20 seconds, just so that we get to a feel for who they are and why they're here. And also then we will be listening to their presentations, which will take approximately five minutes, and we'll be watching time quite carefully. So if you could keep those presentations to five minutes. Um, we're looking to facilitate conversation, and the conversation we're looking to facilitate is how can we take some of the actions from these presentations today to real live behaviours in our communities, in our environments? How can we take the strategies they've adopted? How can we support them? You know, what are some great ideas that have been presented? And if there is controversy or conversation, we'd like to listen to that and hear that, but also try to move along a little bit into how we can move to some of the more positive things that we can start to enable as a result of the conference. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to our first people, if I can hand it over to our moderator. Okay. Thanks. And, uh, one of the reasons why, um, uh, why we're tag teaming a little bit this morning is that I won't be here tomorrow, and in fact, um, uh, Graziella will be presenting back to the plenary at between 9 and 10 on the outcomes of our discussions today. All right, um, uh, um, basically, uh, eight seconds or so to introduce yourself, and then uh, five minutes, and then uh, we'll move through the panel. And more importantly, I think, is um, that's essentially a discussion starter for what will follow, and that, I think that's the important part of uh, this part of the program, what comes out of that broader, uh, broader discussion. So first up, can I ask uh, Denise up to the uh, podium? Thank you. Um, I'm Denise Kauke. I'm the Director of the Humanitarian Crisis Hub. Um, we're a relatively new small organisation that works with community groups that do some sort of human rights promotion on war and conflict. Um, and the groups that we work with are migrant and refugee groups that are working on their countries of origin, so to help the people that they um, had to leave behind. So the kind of work that we do with them is um, we help them with anything from campaigning, advocacy, awareness raising to more um, direct field-based projects like, um, for example, a community group might come up to us and say we want to work out how to get a four-wheel drive ambulance from Melbourne to Afghanistan. Or um, southern Sudanese groups who are looking at um, facilitating um, the election of, um, sorry, the voting of southern Sudanese in Australia in the um, referendum in January. So the kind of work we do them is with them is very broad um, and it depends on what it is, the ideas that they come to us with. We have a, um, a sort of a community development type of methodology. So we don't really initiate the projects, we kind of more respond to um, what they want to do. But what I wanted to focus on today was um, in the idea of um, um, intercultural dialogue and understanding is um, a program that we're working on at the moment um, which we call Stories of Survival. And it uses storytelling to, um, to build peace and to connect migrants and refugees with the wider Australian community and with each other as well as with people around the world. So the kind of um, dialogue that we're looking to facilitate is, um, works on many different levels. It's, the program itself is a five-year program that shares the experiences of ordinary people living in war and conflict. And it tells the stories of how they protect themselves, their families, their communities. Um, and we're really looking at um, the idea of sharing these experiences so that other groups can, um, it's, it's a shared learning, shared experience kind of, um, kind of moment and focusing on the idea of rights protection in um, non-violent approaches to confronting violence and creating peace in armed conflict. It's um, of the six projects that, um, that we have, some of them we've already begun. Um, the first is working with grassroots groups in Australia, um, whereby migrants and refugees, sort of 95% of them are migrants or ex-refugees, um, and they're empowered through mentoring and workshops to tell their own stories using text, art, film, digital technology. And so with 
um, with these stories, the purpose of it is um, is ha has several different purposes. One, when when these stories are told, these sort of very personal and quite inspiring stories are um, out in the Australian community, it helps to break down negative stereotypes of um, refugees and migrants and contribute to you know, greater understanding and therefore, we hope, tolerance. For the people who tell the stories themselves, it's a way of sharing a part of themselves with their new society. Many pe most people are from new and emerging communities, creating that sort of deeper connection. Um, but also another level is creating dialogue and connection between different grassroots groups. Because what we often find is that when we talk about intercultural understanding and tolerance, what we're talking about is a new and emerging community communicating with the broader Australian public or the mainstream of Australia which often has, there are often assumptions of what that normative mainstream Australia actually is, which tends to be um, still in, um, tends to be perceived as white Australia. So we're looking at building those networks between the Palestinian, the Palestinian group, the Tibetan group, the Burmese group, West Papuan <coughs> group, South Sudanese group, whatever the case may be. Um, so as part of this, we're having um, you know a, a cultural event in um, in March next year over here in Fed Square, where um, all the different community groups present their stories. Uh, we're working on research, collecting case studies from around the world of initiatives of self-protection in war and conflict. Um, and the idea behind that is to create a storehouse of ideas that people can then um, learn from, look at, contribute to, and build on. But the, um, the one particular area that we're sort of looking into at the moment is creating an online community hub. Um, so transforming um, our current website into a, um, an interactive, media-rich um, hub environment. And the idea behind this is to provide a platform for people in, in the Asia-Pacific region, but also beyond that, to post comments, video, multimedia articles, and using um, social media tools like Facebook and Twitter to be able to connect people across vast, difference, uh, vast distances. Um, so this hub will upload all these different kinds of stories of self-protection in armed conflict and provide a forum where people can start to exchange strategies and talk about um, what it is that they do to protect themselves so that, so that there's that, um, that learning from each other that can go on. Online seminars and discussion groups. And the last couple of projects in this program is um, uh, publication of book research with um, universities and the humanitarian sector which with, um, with whom we have very close ties. So, I mean, we're basically um, looking at this kind of grassroot, grassroots approach to connecting survivors of war and conflict, whether they are refugees, migrants in Australia or other countries that, that they have um, settled in, or whether they're actually living in situations of war and conflict themselves. And it's creating those links across multiple levels at a grassroots level. Thanks. Thanks, Denise, and we'll keep questions until our panel have all spoken. And uh, 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 but if there are issues that you want to drill down to a bit further uh, with individual speakers, please um, please uh, raise that at the uh, at, at the end of the panel presentations. Next, we've got um, from the Western Bulldogs, Kimmy Lay, um, and uh, I'll hand you over to her to introduce herself. Everyone. Um, my name's Kimmy Lay. I'm the Engaged Communities Manager with the Western Bulldogs Football Club. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with uh, Melbourne and indeed the Western region and what football does mean to <coughs> Australia and particularly to Victorians. But I'm going to go on the assumption that you know a little bit about how football mad we are in, uh, in Victoria um, and I'll try my best to keep to that five minutes. So I did warn Con I can speak forever on this topic, but I'll try not to. So my presentations about our projects um, that we've been working on in the last five years, in particular through sport and recreation, 
and trying to integrate newly arrived humanitarian infants uh, and refugees. So just a little bit of very brief snapshot on where I'm placed within the Western Bulldogs organisation. Um, Western Bulldogs is the community club of the AFL, the Australian Football League, one of 16 clubs. So we're an elite sports club, but we're football and much, much more. Um, Spirit West Service is, is what we call the community arm of the Western Bulldogs, and I manage our engaged communities programs, which focuses on uh, working with people who are new to Australia and other people who are uh, social, at risk of social iso isolation and disengagement. So my background personally is I was born in Hong Kong, I came to Australia when I was five, um, and I'm otherwise known as Miss Kimmy in the field, or um, that Bulldogs lady, or that girl from the Western Bulldogs. So that's my background. Um, I love my football uh, and I love my sport and I like, um, one of the reasons I, why I do enjoy my role is that I'm able to um, filter that passion of mine to new and emerging communities. So we've been delivering sport, uh, multicultural programs since 2005, as well as uh, the Engage Communities program. We run other uh, community initiatives uh, through mainly through targeting uh, youth at risk. Um, and at risk, I mean those that are disengaged from mainstream schooling, have other issues such as drugs and alcohol. So we have an alternative education program um, and we also have early development at Footscray, which we're trying to transform into a community hub. So why a football club? Um, we take our role as the community club of the AFL very seriously and it is our goal and our responsibility to be a community leader. Um, at the bottom line is at a healthier Western region, community is going to mean a healthier Western Bulldogs football club. So we understand that we have a role to play in the community and that we can provide aspirational as well as inspirational opportunities to newly arrived communities and in the Western region in particular. Um, I won't go into the stats too much, but needless to say, the Western region of Melbourne is one of the most diverse regions in Victoria, if not Australia, and one of the fastest growing regions. A little bit more about cultural diversity. The two main groups, or actually three main groups that we target, um, are still the Vietnamese, who, are, who form a significant part of Maribyrn and Brimbank. Um, but in terms of newly arrived communities, we've been working very closely with the communities from Burma uh, in the last two or three years through the Settlement Grants Program. As I said, I'll skip through this so, so I can get into the gist of it and, and give you some practical um, examples of what we've been doing out in field. So our multicultural and settlement programs are funded by the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. We also receive some th funding from the AFL through their multicultural programs um, to basically deliver a lot of programs through sport and recreation, uh, working with these newly arrived communities. That picture that you see is just an example of uh, one of our key projects, our bike education project. So what we try to do is um, not just use sport as a vehicle to, to engage with people, but to empower them as well. So that young lady giving directions, she's actually went through a youth leadership program about bike education, and now she's teaching another Karen kid um, how to be safe on the road. So we also try to target sports that can teach them life skills, such as bike education, which also means road education, um, and hopefully means that they can be safe, safer in the community. Um, another example of that type of life skills teaching is our swimming project, and using swimming as a basis to teach life skills about water safety and education. Um, so we're trying to use sport as a vehicle, not just about fun and socialising, but about teaching employability skills and empowering young people in particular to be active in their community. So our model is about building trust with participants um, and the ultimate aim is to have people enter mainstream sports participation, sports clubs and associations, but we understand that is a very long way from where these people start from. So at the all we are about at the very start is just building trust with participants and hopefully through um, teaching them skills, working towards common goals and exposing, to, exposing them to different areas of sport and uh, recreation, there will be some that built into the mainstream participation. So the clear, uh, sorry, the key features of our program are clear aims, objectives and principles. So our principles are about teach the teacher, pay it forward. 
So that's they, we teach a small group and then they reach their communities. Um, we're very client focused. It's about re-engaging participants. Um, it's about empowerment and advocacy. Is that a sign, Tom? Okay. Um, and we rely a lot on partnerships. We never do anything in isolation. We always make sure that there is at least one other partner, if not multiple partners, involved in our, in our projects. These are some of the challenges that we face. The best example I can give you is that picture of God knows where in Africa of the women playing volleyball and we, here we are trying to expect them to transfer what they know about volleyball into what we expect of people wearing uniform, indoor sports, six aside, formal rules and structures. Um, I won't go into too much of this, but some of the tips that I can um, provide that we have found have worked in the last five <coughs> years is uh, doing your research, knowing your, your participants. So we see people for their strengths rather than weaknesses. Um, language in particular is a strength rather than weakness. Um, we, it's all about two-way learning, so we try to learn a little something from the community and they teach us a lot and um, we teach them as well. Um, for organisations, the, the main tips are that we need, you need genuine support from the top. So at the Bulldogs, we're lucky we do have that uh, support from our board and management. Um, and as I said before, it's about building trust and planning for sustainability. Thanks, Gibby. All right, uh, uh, next up we've got uh, Vass, the Victorian Arabic Social Services, um, and we've got Lisa and Jasmine, I think, who'll be uh, doing a joint presentation. Hello, thank you for your time. We won't take too much of your time. We'll try to stick to the six minutes. Is that five? Five. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, my name's Lisa, I'm the Youth Services Coordinator at the Victorian Arabic Social Services. And my name is Jasmine, I'm also from the Victorian Arabic Social Services, I'm one of the peer leaders but also <coughs> I'm working on um, the We Are One project. So we're just going to go through um, one of the projects that we're running at the moment, I'll just grab it. So um, Victorian Arabic uh, Social Services is a non-for-profit organisation. Um, its head office is in Broadmeadows um, and it services all of Victoria. Basically the target group is um, Arabic speaking background communities which pretty much covers, it's quite obviously very diverse and um, covers 22 countries of the Arab world. But in saying that, VAS is an inclusive organisation so it doesn't um, reject people that are non, uh, not from an Arabic speaking background. Um, in the youth services department, um, we're working with young people mainly between the ages of about 13 to 25. Um, especially after September 11, there's been some extra barriers that young people may, have, may be facing in Australia. But in saying that, every young person is unique. So we look at all the different factors um, that play in their lives. So things like um, some of the risk factors, um, such as coming from a low-income background, poor housing, um, not being able to engage in the mainstream service system, education system, employment system. So in taking these unique factors of the individual's life, we also see some themes that have emerged in some areas of Melbourne um, around disengagement from mainstream communities. Um, and yeah, a lot of um, reports of racism and discrimination in schools, in workplaces and in the broader society. So we're trying to work with young people to to get them to um, have more opportunities in their life, to um, meet new people and to um, foster ideas that they might have and to mentor um, young people to um, actually deliver the ideas that they have. Um, so the Al Musawat is one program that um, we've been um, running and it's basically designed to strengthen Arabic speaking background young people's engagement and contribution to the wider society. Um, the Al Musawat actually means a fair go. So it's kind of that whole idea of equal opportunity. Some of the project activities have been um, 
personal and professional development workshops, case management and mediation, um, sports programs, leadership programs, community safety programs, linking young people to emergency service providers, um, and mentoring young people through their student placements um, at VAS. So um, if they've got TAFE, sometimes TAFE students find it hard to get student placements, so we actually um, are open to mentoring them through that. Some of the achievements have been um, our youth radio programs on 3CR and 3ZZZ, um, young people being trained in multimedia um, and graphic design, um, body image programs for young men, um, getting young men to get linked into certificate in, in soccer coaching. Um, but the whole idea is about youth participation. So with these programs, the young, young men themselves actually design and deliver the programs themselves. So they get those leadership skills while they're there. Um, soccer programs, linking young people to first aid, um, pool lifeguard awards, uh, young men's um, life skills and basketball camps, um, and our um, Calam TV show, which um, we're going to pass it over to Jasmine now to have a little bit of a talk about that. Um, it's a, a show that's on Channel 31, um, which, look, which involved a lot of young people to um, get training in this area of, of facilitating um, a TV show. Um, soccer programs for girls and, um, again, that student placement thing. So I'm not going to talk too much. I'm just going to hand it over to Jasmine now. So pretty much what Kalam TV was about, um, a lot of young people from Arabic speaking backgrounds, they were sort of feeling a bit isolated and kind of, you know, in the mainstream TV, there wasn't really a good representation of um, Arabs. You know, it was like Arab terrorists this and terrorists that, and, you know. There wasn't really anything that um, demonstrated the real culture of the Arabic, Arabic world. So we got together and um, we decided to make a, a show. It's a variety show. Um, and we look at different sort of aspects of the Arabic culture. Um, we look at different countries each week. Um, we have special guests and they come in um, and have a chat about what they do. Um, we've got like a game show segment that we'll, I'll show now. Um, we've got some box pops, so different, different things happening. Um, and just showcasing what the Arab world is all about. Um, the real Arab world, not, not what you see on you know, Hollywood and TV. It's just you know, really raw, getting down to it. Um, you know, meeting real people. Um, and yeah, have a look at the clip. Yeah, let me know how you can see it. <coughs> I'm Zainab Alouf. And I'm Jim Salim. Welcome to Kalam Television. I'm Muhammad Alaisi. And I'm Jasmine Aweda. <coughs> and in today's documentary, we're going to be exploring the Arab world, Egypt. Now, now Dr. Fakhri, I've seen you. You've brought in some uh, fantastic items here. Maybe if you could run us through uh, what some of these mean. I can tell you how fine are these decorations is made, Libya. Yeah, What's this is basically when you have a lot of crowd and you're like, you fill it up with jasmine water and you just spray it around them so everybody gets sprayed cool water. So, like, during summer, it's really pleasant to have. Uh, so, it's got holes in here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, just, water? you just basically just oh, do okay. this. You stand above everybody and you go like this and everybody so gets sprayed. So, you don't sprayed. throw rice? Or <laughs> no, we don't throw, <laughs> throw rice. Iraq. Uh, yeah. It's got a hole. So, it's maybe a few more years. Uh, have a guess. Uh, I'm going to say, is that a pillowcase? That's right. What? Morocco. Can we have a look? Actually, this is what I do for cooking classes. I teach people how to do cooking classes. Wow. That's the, that's the beef. Did you put that on the stove or is that in the yes. oven? Yes, on the stove. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stove. So, okay, well, can you explain what, what's okay, in it? Okay, this is the beef, a prune, and almond. Almond, wow. And this is cooked for about six hours. Somalia. This is the, uh, the camel bell. Um, you can see it's got bells. And the strings are, it's a traditional clothes that the men Somalian wear, which we call it Nawis. And um, you just put it on the back. Where does it go? Around the, um, around the, uh, the camel's neck. Jordan, Lebanon, 
Saudi Arabia, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, Palestine, Tunisia, Kuwait, Algeria, Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Mauritania, Djibouti, and Comoros. Hi, my name is Hanan Khalil. I'm from Kalam TV. We'll be doing a few box pops today on who's your favorite role model? Oh. Let's go. Hi, how are you? Hi. My name is Hanan Khalil. What's yours? My name, my name is Alabim. Alabim? That's a really nice name. Um, who's your favorite role model? Uh, my brother. Your brother? And what's your brother's name? Uh, my brother is uh, Matt. Matt. Hi, Matt. How are you? Thank you. So why is he your favorite role model? Uh, because uh, always I, I follow his way or yeah. he always teach me many things. He taught me many things Yeah, from well, since, a while, since I was a very little. So. Yeah. Excellent. It sounds like my little sister. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Enjoy your food. Hi, what's your name? Nadine. Nadine, what's the most embarrassing moment? The most embarrassing moment is once I went calls for shopping and I got all this stuff and then on the counter I realised I didn't have my wallet on me. That's why now I carry it in a plastic bag. How embarrassing. <laughs> that joke. Thank you so much. Of Arabs contributed to Australia. Well, I think there's definitely a big impact on food and there's uh, some Arab staples have become very staples in um, Australian uh, Main Street. The things like kebabs and uh, Lebanese pastries, Lebanese bread, uh, that's only the food side. But there's also like, uh, uh, I think they have an impact on the sense of identity in Australian society today because I think Australia today is a mixture of all the people living here and there is definitely a bit of an influence in that as well. As you have seen throughout this series, the Arabic community is a diverse and vibrant one which covers many cultures and traditions, which makes it so interesting. I find the Arabic language interesting. Traditionally speaking, it's a very polite language, you know. Mm -hmm. There's ways to say thank you, you're welcome, and then another you're welcome to the you're welcome. You don't <laughs> get that in many languages. No. Well, as, as you know, like Australia is a multicultural country and like it has different colours and the Arab, the Arabic um, Speaking background, people is one of the colours. Basically what I'll be doing today is walking through some of the dress that uh, women and men in the Middle East would uh, typically wear. Um, so, oh, so with this um, Kalam TV, we've finished the first series this year and um, we've thankfully got um, a heads up from Channel 31 saying that they'd love to have us back. So next year um, we'll be back again for another series. I'm not too sure what we'll do if it's sort of similar or, or different, but we might have like some cooking segments or something. I don't know. But yeah, um, and it's really, um, I don't know for me, it's, it's just been really amazing experience working with different people, um, getting to know a little bit about film and, and television, um, getting to meet different people from different um, <laughs> parts of the Arab world that I haven't been able to sort of meet before and um, yeah, definitely new friendships that, you know, will probably last for a very long time and yeah, um, so that's definitely been a really, like a great highlight for me um, this year. Okay, thank you, uh, Lisa and Jasmine. Now, moving right along, we went a bit over time there, but we'll, we'll catch up. Um, next up, we've got Essendon Bo Football Club, and um, I'll hand over to um, Ida.
Firstly, my name is Edda Louise Martins and I'm here from the Essendon Football Club. Um, and like Kimmy alluded to before, football clubs these days here in Australia are a lot more than just a football club. Uh, there are different aspects of the football club and one of our biggest aspects is obviously our community department. And Essendon's been involved in uh, working with a lot of community programs, mainly multicultural and indigenous programs, for over the last 10 years now. Our last coach, sorry, two coaches ago, in Kevin Sheedy, um, did start uh, the ball rolling pretty much in a sense that once Essendon started to recruit a lot of indigenous players, well, we felt the need that we had to, uh, to give back to the indigenous community, and that's where it all started from. So as you can see there, community is one of the club's pillars and one of the club's uh, major focus points. Uh, now, one of the programs that I'm here to talk about is actually called the Unity Cup. Now, the Unity Cup was a concept that was first developed in the year 2008 uh, through our community officer and the Australian Federal Police. Uh, so, in 2008, the Eston Football Club and the Australian Federal Police came together to create a program that uses the power of, of sport to achieve uh, four of the following aims. So, we wanted to create a positive uh, relationship to increase trust between the Muslim communities and also the police and Australian Federal Police. We wanted to increase cultural awareness and understanding of the diversity of Muslim communities and the issues relevant to Muslim communities across the general ranks of police. Uh, we wanted to create a platform for a two-way flow of information and I think that really is a key focus because after the events of September 11, um, you know, relationships did break down and made it very difficult for the Australian police and the Muslim communities to actually engage with one another. Um, and we also utilise the brand that EFC has to take the game of AFL football to new and emerging multicultural communities and create a new generation of fans. So in 2008, the steering committee was established consisting of members from a, uh, a number of Muslim communities uh, around Melbourne, uh, the AFP, EFC, the Essendon Football Club and also Victoria Police. Uh, the concept that we came was basically a lightning premiership type, uh, type of tournament where we invited along four uh, Muslim communities to play in a round robin competition over a whole day. Um, and the day included event, you know, with the police and the emergency services displays and various activities for women and children throughout the day. Um, things such as jumping castles for all the kids. A lot of the players will actually come down and, uh, and sign autographs and actually spend the day with the communities. Uh, the event received strong support for the government agencies, uh, the AFL sponsors and local businesses and each year we, we're attempting to grow the, uh, the partners that we actually invite to come and work within the program. And in 2010, this year's event, we actually invited the North Melbourne Football Club to get involved, um, which was a great success this year as well. And on an average over the last three years that we've had the event, We've had a crowds of about 1,500 people coming down to Windy Hill where we've actually hosted the event. Um, and, you know, it's a great sight to see, like the old football days when you used to, to see the suburban football. It gives it a great feel when you see 1,500 people back at Windy Hill to support these players who are playing on the day. Now, the Unity Cup highlighted the role of Australian football in promoting and celebrating harmony, uh, social cohesion, and the positive impact of cultural diversity within Australia. So going back to it, so for this year's event, we uh, invited the North Melbourne Football Club along. Uh, the event, but, uh, sorry, going back to the North Melbourne Football Club, again, working with the four communities, what we did, we actually split the two communities up. So we had two communities go off and work with the North Melbourne Football Club, and we worked with two communities down at Windy Hill and the Essendon Football Club. And basically what we did there is that we trained these guys uh, for two, three weeks before the event, just so they could get to know one another, they could form that, that team spirit that we wanted to um, to have them all engage, I suppose. Um, so again, the event included you know, emergency displays or food stores. There was an Oz kick session for all the kids and that worked fantastically. So halfway through the day, we probably had about three, 400 kids out on the oval participating in an Oz kick clinic. And we also had the SNA North Melbourne players coming down. But one of the key things from this year's event is that we also came up with the idea of putting together an all-star team from the four communities and we had hoped that um, with our partners in Sydney and through the AFL, we would find another all-star team to go out there and play against. And that did happen this year. And uh, speaking from a personal aspect now, I was part of that team that played on the day. And I can honestly say that without this program or with myself not being at Essendon, I probably would have never engaged within the Muslim community. And the things, you know, that I've made so many friends from that day or from that trip 
that I still talk to now. And it was just great just to actually learn a lot more about their faith and their beliefs. And just to note, the Victorian All-Star team did beat the Sydney All-Star team as well. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, we still do have the trophy here. Yeah. <laughs> So basically the outcomes of the Unity Cup and, you know, and what we're trying to grow each year are the strong relationships and trust. And going back just to relationship and trust, one of the things that we did do up there in Sydney is we asked these kids, and it was a group of you know, 24 players aged between 18 to 32, and you know, just the feedback when we asked them how can we you know, look at going forward and what have you thought of the past three events, and just for one of them to put their hand up and say that, you know, two years ago, they would have never, ever, ever thought that they'll be playing football next to an Australian po you know, federal police officer, let alone a Victorian police officer. So, the, you know, the Unity Cup has come quite a long way, but these barriers now beginning to break down, and the relationship between all three organisations, um, you know, has enhanced over the years. So, a successful model that is replaceable and scalable, they're the things that we're trying to grow uh, into next year's event, and next year we're hoping that we can invite teams like the Western Bulldogs, teams like Richmond Football Club, um, who also deliver multicultural programs around Victoria. Uh, and basically, you know, an increased cultural awareness for uh, the Australian Federal Police, the Essendon Football Club, North Melbourne Football Club, Victoria Police. Um, so looking ahead to 2011, um, once again, we're looking at inviting more clubs to come down and participate. We also want to invite other communities and cultures to join the Unit Cup to give them the experience as well. And also next year we're looking at exploring the opportunities to have a curtain raiser game at one of the major AFL games next year. And basically that is our aim for 2011 is that hopefully like we went up to Sydney this year, we can bring either an indigenous or a multicultural side from around Australia and have a curtain raiser game at the MCG or Eden Head Stadium. That concludes my presentation. <laughs> And the DVD will say the rest, and then I will be available for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, as I've introduced, my name's Amy Hill. I'm a youth settlement worker for Spectrum Migrant Resource Centre. Um, at Spectrum, we don't just do youth. We've got an age section, an immigration section, um, settlement, general settlement section, and also um, education training, amongst other things. We're very involved with um, community leaders. And the DVD that I'm going to show you um, now is about a, um, a camp that we ran in April called Lead the Way that was in partnership with Australian Camps Association and funded by Vic Health. And that involved um, training up community leaders from six different communities. Um, Peter was one of those actually, um, on how to run camps for young people within their own communities and, and others. Um, so there was three weekends of training and then it eventuated in this camp which you'll just get a glimpse of now. Giant swing is my favorite. The giant swing. Probably the giant swing. <laughs> my favorite activity was the giant swing. <laughs> At first it was very like really scary, but you know I really enjoyed it. It was tempting and it was funny when you left the white, your hat drops and then when you come back it's so funny. Okay, what's the name? Yeah, three, two, one. So when the friends just uh, pull the rope, it was not uh, scary, but when you just uh, cord the rope, yeah. it would be so scary. <laughs> you know, meeting people and stuff, yeah. like get to know each other, playing sport. Uh, I have the good memory of the, the bow and arrow. Yeah, yeah. I really love it too. The archery, you enjoyed that. Yeah. Terrific. <laughs> 
getting a friendly and enjoy, enjoy with friends to playing basketball or other things? Yeah, the uh, night time, the, our friends just um, talking each other, interacting each other, and I really did at the same time. Yeah, the heart was my favorite. Yeah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I learned um, basketball, which I've never played before. Oh, right. And I got to know other, like, girls from the street. That's cool. I learned how to jerk more, which is dance. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I learned so many new things, how to make new friends, how to different language, even though I can understand, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, different people from different countries and have fun. I uh, like flying fox, I have enjoyed that. Friendship is very important and meeting new people, that's like the most important thing, actually. I wanted to use that DVD because I think it can speak to the camp much better than I can and hearing the voices from the young people um, does that very clearly. So yeah, the communities that, re that were represented in the young people were Assyrian, Chaldean from Iraq, Liberian, Sierra Leone, Somali, Sudanese and Iranian and it was a real, real mismatch of culture and um, of young people that were very newly arrived to the country. Some had only been here um, a few months and had limited English. Um, but as you can see, that they, you know, there's things that they really got out of that from, from interacting with other cultures. Um, and just so good too for the community leaders to, um, to work together in that training leading up to the camp and to work together in delivering that and monitoring discipline and you know, looking after um, young people from diverse cultures you know, and gaining that respect um, across the board. So it was a really successful um, camp and we're hoping to do it again um, this coming year. Uh, and I guess similar to that camp, um, I've run a couple of others too in the Australian bush and that's been mixing a smaller number of about 20 and going camping, um, cooking our meals over the fire together, <laughs> going and visiting some um, traditional um, indigenous paintings of the local area and, and having um, some talks from Parks Victoria about the environment and the, and, you know, the nature that, that we were camping in for that time. And that experience was, was one that really um, was just fantastic in in the young people not only experiencing each other's cultures but also the yeah the diverse cu culture of this country Australia and its um, history and heritage um, so there's lots to be learned and lots to be gained thank you so Evie and Peter well our last um, panelist or speaker um, is um, a Sanctuary Australia Foundation and Peter's going to present to us My name is Peter Hallam and I represent, I'm the CEO of Sanctuary Australia Foundation and um, we've been uh, operating for 23 years and uh, we believe that integration occurs mostly, um, most easily when people have the opportunity to get to know each other well and understand each other's lives. Our organisation, the Sanctuary Australia Foundation, has created a community-based model that makes this possible. Let me give you a brief uh, overview of our work. Sanctuary's story began in 1986 when my wife and I were visiting Mexico City and we met a humble, quietly spoken American priest who was living in a very poor uh, condition in a Christian-based community sheltering refugees from El Salvador and Guatemala. As we listened to their shocking experiences, we knew, we knew that we must try to help. It was a life-changing experience for us, and we were living in Canada at the time. And as a result of our sponsorship, two of the families were accepted, and they started a new life in Western Canada. We emigrated to Australia in 1987. In 1987, we travelled around, and then we chose to settle in Coffs Harbour with three of our, our three young sons. 
We were surprised to find that our ne next door neighbors were newly arrived refugees from Vietnam. Within a year, we had set up a sanctuary um, community-based refugee support group and worked in liaison with the Department of Immigration in Sydney. It was not easy to start this in a regional area, but with growing community support and improving infrastructure, it was successful. And we managed to fit this in and around our regular work for the first few years, as we were both self-employed at the time. And in my slide presentation, I've uh, put a few celebrities in there because we get not one cent from the government and we rely entirely on the corporate sector and the private sector. And uh, there are people who you know very well in the Australian media, but it's not showing off, it's simply that we, we needed them in order to raise the funds that we badly need on an ongoing basis. This is my wife with the Sudanese um, arrival. Uh, this family here is um, from Bosnia and it's um, a mixed marriage and uh, were not wanted by um, either side in the war in Bosnia. And so um, I have to uh, I'm actually staying with them at the time, uh, right now. Um, but they, um, you know, I have to, I have to really uh, congratulate the Department of Immigration as much as they, you know, really saw how mixed marriages were have serious, these serious problems, um, you know, in that, in their own country. Um, uh, this uh, young girl is from Somalia and lives in Brisbane. Um, we have Sudanese here in Coffs Harbour, um, Karim um, from Burma, and there's a couple of children with a Dorigo uh, child, and uh, my wife and myself welcoming the Sudanese at the airport, Karim people again. from Sudan. From the Congo, I believe. From Sudan. <coughs> Peter Kundal. <coughs> Jack Thompson. And the medical fraternity uh, <coughs> who helped us is um, uh, George Negus. And uh, the Somalis, Vietnamese, and the list goes on. From Iraq. Somalia, from the Congo, very emotional meeting. Our program is unique in as much as we get to know the people before they arrive, because they're private sponsorships, un unlike government sponsorships. And um, we welcomed our first uh, refugee family from Chile in 1988. Since then, over 22 years, we've sponsored and welcomed more than 3,000 cases. Many war-torn countries, including El Salvador, Chile, Vietnam, Bosnia, Iraq, Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Congo, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, and Burma. We believe that all victims of war have the right to a safe and hopeful future with dignity regardless of background or creed. Our um, latest advertising campaign, this is uh, approved uh, by Yoko Ono's lawyers in New York. And um, it's the peace symbol um, with the uh, various religious, you know, Christian, Hindu, uh, Jewish, Muslim, and peace stuff. Give peace a chance, John Lennon, and our um, name on the back of the T-shirt. Um, the printing was done by um, young offenders in Port Phillip Prison doing time. 
And uh, so we try to include, you know, as much of uh, charity as possible. We receive many requests to help from desperate people and sponsor many of the forgotten refugees, mostly women and children, who spent years without hope in overcrowded, dangerous camps. Many have experienced horror, horror beyond our imagination, yet we are constantly amazed by the incredible resilience, strength, and perseverance of refugees that we assist. Those who are finally accepted under Australian humanitarian visa program are un unfunded, so they're at risk of losing their precious short-term visa, and sometimes even their lives without the money for their airfares. To remedy this situation, we set up the Sanctuary Travel Loan Fund to provide interest-free airfare loans, which recipients gradually repay once settled over two to three years. This money is then recycled to help others, and it's an innovative and successful scheme, and it's sustainable. With 98% repayment record, recipients understand just how important it is that the money is repaid to help others left behind in the camps. Our dream was to make Coffs Harbour a centre of peace for refugees, bringing local people together to welcome and help former refugees to feel at home in their new community. It grew beyond our wildest dreams. In 2002, Sanctuary was honoured to receive the Oscar National Humanitarian Award at Parliament House in Sydney and the coverage uh, triggered interest nationwide. As a result, we found ourselves travelling to different centres, teaching and training groups on refugee settlement issues in communities across Australia. Since then, we've inspired and initiated community-based sanctuary refugee support groups in 10 regional metropolitan centres from Perth to Rockhampton, Albury to Melbourne, all following our successful model. We provide ongoing support and training as new families are welcomed. Our Sanctuary Australia Foundation head office provides the airfare loan for each new group, first family, and then the group works together to raise money, money locally to be able to assist another family, often relatives of the new arrivals. Have I got a... a is that all? <laughs> okay. I wanted to go, so I'm going to miss some out, but what we're especially proud of is um, our employment record, getting people into employment, particularly in areas like Rockhampton, where we have a, uh, an Anglican priest up there who speaks one-to-one -one with the employers and gets them into employment really, really quickly. Um, I myself <coughs> also have worked with uh, Muslim uh, my minority uh, Arab groups uh, and got them into employment very quickly, just pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, and getting them employed eventually. Um, so we're... All of our cases are non-related, meaning they're non-linked, <coughs> and um, uh, so um, you know we're unique in that way. Um, we have a strong need for a national training centre, and few organisations in the world provide direct sponsorship help to desperate refugees and an ongoing settlement help when they arrive. I've recently come back from Canada. The Mennonites say there's plenty of room in Canada for a sanctuary organization, <coughs> but we need the money. <coughs> Have I? <No>. Okay. Um, <coughs> sanctuary ha also has a pin friend project linking directly to a person in a refugee camp by email, giving an out outside link to a refugee. This works especially well with teenagers who learn so much through this direct contact and often start projects at school. The results can be amazing. For instance, in 2008, a local high school raised $10,000. It was used to fund an interest-free airfare loan for a Congolese widow and her five children. Two now attend that same school and is being recycled to help another refugee family. Sanctuary is a multi-award winning registered independent non-profit organization receives no government funding relying solely on the generosity of businesses and the wider Australian community. We have wonderful patrons and supporters including, as I said before, Jack Thompson, Kate Phelan, George Negus, Kerry O'Brien, writers Arnold Zabi, Stephen Bidolf and businessman Dick Smith. We believe that working together can really make a difference. Many people are deeply concerned about refugees, especially in our present political climate, and want to help. And when we focus together on people's needs and beliefs in the capacity 
uh, believe that in the capacity to contribute, anything is possible. We are especially proud of our geographic spread and the networking with employers and mentors. Um, we've, we've worked with service clubs where um, we've shown a video and we've had five or six different Africans talking and we've had Rotarians come up from the audience and actually offer to mentor and get them into employment. And many of those people now own their own homes. They're paying mortgages. And I call that integration. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, my apologies for sort of hurrying people along. I, 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 I know there's a lot of information and knowledge people want to impart. impart but the next um, half hour or so that we've got available to us, I suppose, is really about how can we tap into all of this work um, that we're involved in um, so that uh, we can build on the work that other people are doing and make linkages <coughs> and um, perhaps uh, develop more of a community of um, uh, uh, organisations and individuals who are working on issues around migrant and refugee settlement integration um, uh, uh, and the community relations issues that arise from that. I think it was Denise that mentioned um, uh, the, the need to maybe share this sort of material on a website or, or, or something like that, even though we've sort of all got slightly different uh, um, um, approaches to, uh, to similar issues. Um, before we throw it open to the floor and, um, and, and, and get you all involved in perhaps how we can take this forward, I'd just like to po point out two websites where this is being done um, at the moment uh, that, that we could perhaps use as a way of uh, building on how we share information. Certainly for my area, which is local government, there is a website which you might like to visit and uh, explore. It's called Step One, uh, one word, Step One. If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, and that's a national website for local councils uh, where they put best practice examples of work they're doing on migrant refugee settlement uh, and related community relations issues. More importantly for this group, I think, um, there's a new website that the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations launched last May, which I think you all should visit, and uh, particularly our pan panelists should consider putting uh, your projects as examples of best practice so that they can be viewed around Australia and, in fact, around the world. Uh, you can access that website, uh, which is called IBIS, um, uh, which is um, uh, 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 Integration and building inclusive societies, IBIS. And it's a sort of an online community for people like ourselves who are involved in migrant integration where you can, in 300 words, uh, describe your project and give contact details if people want to find out more information. So again, you can access that website by going onto the UN AOC website. On the right hand uh, side of the homepage, you'll see the IBIS link um, and you can explore that link. Already many of, or a number of you have uh, uh, best uh, or good practice uh, case studies there. I know Western Bulldogs has got a, a case study there and I'd encourage you all to, to consider contributing to that. And just finally, uh, before we move for, to um, a broader discussion, uh, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations is considering doing a regional launch. They've already done their international launch last May of that website, but they're considering um, and are very close to finalizing a regional um, uh, Asia Pacific uh, launch of that website here in Melbourne next February and I'd encourage everybody to uh, get their examples of, of good practice onto that website so that it can be included in the publicity that surrounds that, uh, that website launch. Okay, enough from me. Um, um, I'd like to throw it over to the floor now and um, really to broaden the discussion around perhaps uh, themes uh, such as how we might um, uh, find uh, some infrastructure, whether uh, 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 some uh, method of communicating and working together on the sort of uh, 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 projects that we're all working on individually. Does anyone want to open that discussion? Yes, over, over here. Sorry, I, if people could just say their name and the organisation they're from and then, and then um, put their question or their statement. Yes, yes. Uh, it was more his leadership that kicked it off. Um, and if 
bit of bulge into a culture at the Essendon Football Club. So from Kevin Sheedy starting that program and bringing in Indigenous players, it filtered right down through to our members and supporters that they're very proud when they say I'm an Essendon supporter. They know the work that we also do with the Indigenous community. He did. So he, he pioneered and a lot of other clubs after he had pioneered it went that way as well. Okay. Yes. Yes, off you go. Um, and if, if I could get people to speak up so that people down the back can hear as well. I can speak for myself in terms of the Bulldogs and also myself personally. Um, our programs are not just about the participation side of it and playing into it. There's other avenues to participation in football, either through volunteering. Um, we do umpiring programs so that we encourage both females and males to be boundary and goal umpires as well as field umpires. Um, we also encourage uh, people to just become fans of the game as much as participants and that also that means a belonging to a club and feel like they're a member of their community by saying I'm a Bulldog supporter or that opens up conversations with other people within the community. Um, you know, every workplace has a footy ticking competition kind of thing. It's where they, if you know something about football, be it male or female, you, there's, there's an in for you to start uh, conversations with other people within the community. Um, in terms of participation of females, um, a lot of our development programs are not gender specific, so we do programs in schools which are both open to females and males. Um, and I guess when we play games, we have females and males divisions. So uh, two examples I can bring to that is we have a primary school competition, we've got males and females separate divisions, and then in our interrange carnival, we have male and female separate competitions. Um, and myself personally, I don't play football, but I have a lot of mates that do um, play female football and I try to get the Victorian Men's Football League involved in a lot of our programs as well. <coughs> and very similar to Kimber as well, so we run a number of different programs where um, we encourage both boys and girls or males and females to come along and participate. Um, the Essendon Football Club also sponsors the Victorian Youth Girls yeah. Academy, uh, which is an academy that was set up through the Bill Hutchinson Foundation and AFL Victoria. Um, to encourage up and coming teenagers who, uh, females so, who are playing football and they, each year they select a squad of about 25 girls who then go off and do elite training, hopefully trying to get into an AFL type women's league, um, which I definitely know the AFL are very keen to, um, to establish over the next few years. I might just quickly mention another organisation that's involved in this field that's uh, working with all sports, um, male and female, and that's Sports Without Borders. Uh, which is an organisation that's headed up by James Demetrio and that's certainly worth um, having a look at if you're looking at opportunities for resourcing um, uh, 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 young people from migrant refugee background uh, getting into sport. Mm. Okay, down the back there. Thank you everybody and uh, I'm really impressed by what everybody's doing and what everybody has been doing, uh, especially the uh, Sanctuary Foundation. It, it's great because to me, having Australians, real Australians doing it by their own and bringing people and really helping them get jobs and live a life like everybody else is great. Um, now, saying that, I. I always have a question and I haven't got an answer to it. Uh, in, in the area of integration, I don't know whether all of us are thinking of the same thing or a different thing, but put that aside, uh, and settlement and all that, services that government puts in money and all these activities, beautiful, great. But I have one question. Is that actually making a difference? And how do we know? Do we have a way of measuring that? Thank you. 
question. I mean, do, does anyone from our panel want to have a go at opening the discussion on how do we measure whether we're making a difference? Yeah, off you go. It's not that I have an answer for it, but being someone who was in that shoes, I came to Australia <laughs> seven years ago as a young person. I'm still young. <laughs> but in, in terms of measuring, I think it's on individual level because the services are, they come as the organi this organization is working for this particular group of people. But those activities are actually on individual basis. So the measurement will come on individual basis, which is if someone is making, a, there is no research that I know of that show that. But if you, if an organization show an example of someone whose life has changed, for example, when I came here, I had a social worker, and that social worker supported me, and when they supported <coughs> me, that's when I actually went on achieving what I have achieved. So that support is there, and if it is there, I think I'm the evidence of that, but there is no statistic showing that. That's, that's the best I could go. But with the question of integration, I think integration is used in a way that you find your own way instead of you actually being said that do this, but if you are able to find your own way in the society, in your new society where you are settling in, I think that will help with integration because you don't have to abandon your own way of living, but you don't have to, you have to find your own way to live in a new society that you are in because you came and you find a culture established and you have to find your way, own way to that culture. I think that's how far I could go. Can I have a Can yes, go ahead. answering that as well? Um, that's always a hard one because I guess with all the funding, it's always dependent on what uh, evidence you have and quantitative measure is, is so hard to get. You know, you can say how many people came to your event or how many people participated in your football team, but how do you measure those qualitative um, integration measures is really difficult. Um, what we look for with our programs is the little wins, um, and that comes from speaking with individuals and, and, and just seeing them progress from year one to the end of the year or in three years' time, and seeing how they couldn't speak English the first time you met them to now you know, having full-time jobs or having a real hobby in something um, and becoming part of that. And you can see the difference that uh, our programs, our connection with them have made. Um, an example I can give, through our programs, which I just think is a lovely example, and I smile every time I think of it, is uh, through our football programs, we reach a lot of the communities in Burma, the Korean refugees. Uh, one of the girls um, who I saw, who I first met three years ago, asked me this year if I can help her um, give her some footballs because she's going back to Burma and she wants to show them how to play football mm -hmm. and introduce that sport to them. So that was an, a little example of what empowerment means, that they actually want to help others in their community through us helping them in the first instance. Mm -hmm. But I mean, th th that's an excellent question. And I think as a broader community at the national level and even at the state level, particularly at the national level, we are well overdue for a large scale review and evaluation of how well we're going. That might potentially be something that um, comes out of our discussion today in terms of something that we can take forward with state and federal government. Um, it's a long time since uh, there's been a comprehensive uh, and deep evaluation and review of how well we're travelling. Individual projects are evaluated, often as part of the funding agreement. Um, there are a number of uh, studies that are underway at the moment, but they're not the whole picture, and I think it's incumbent on the federal government uh, to... Um, perhaps look at um, a, a more comprehensive stock take of where we're at, how well we're doing, and, and what are the options uh, and, and, and what's the identified best practice for how we go forward. Sure. Yeah, back in um, 1992, we had uh, Rise Becker um, the, from Starts uh, who came to Cross Harbour and she um, she actually got all the Salvadoran women together and the children in a separate room. And the children all did sketches. And um, most of the children had drawn rainbows in their, in their sketches. And she said this was, to sh uh, this was actually showing that the children were much better settled in regional <coughs> Australia than they, their counterparts in the city. 
and it was put down to the fact that the streets were quieter, less threatening, and, and uh, Rise herself, a um, clinical psychologist is from South Africa, and she said the Salvadoran women were actually uh, better settled and she said were much more, uh, you know, from torture and trauma, much better than the um, Salvador, uh, than the Soweto women in, in Africa. She compared them to Soweto women who'd been raped and so on. So, um, so I, I think that's another perspective of, of, of it. But we get um, regularly, every year around Christmas time, um, we'll, so just out of the blue, people will have our house full of Vietnamese um, that we'd sponsored, you know, 15, 18 years earlier. And we're now seeing four, five, six generations. <laughs> it's amazing, you know. And I think that's a bit of a measure. Anyway, that's <laughs> okay, we've got a couple. I'll take the one down there and then, and then you. Off you go. about settlement outcomes, but it doesn't give us the full picture. Mm -hmm. So we're realizing we need to talk to clients about when do you feel settled. And what we're finding is just the language is a problem in itself. Our Arabic speaking clients are looking at us saying we don't know settled. So then we're trying to find other language and saying, well, how do you know when you belong? Or how do you know you feel home? Mm -hmm. And again, that's a problem because people are saying, but this isn't home. This is different than home. This isn't like home. Home had other things. This is something new. So I think it's a conversation, and it's well worth raising because we think we understand it, but the yes. complexity yes. of a generation or multi-generations yes. experiencing life is worth revisiting and coming yes. back to and starting the conversation yes. openly. Well, that's right. I mean, the starting point for anything like that is, you know, what are the, what, what are the performance indicators? Um, yeah. You know, are they about being oriented to the new society, being able to access and receive services, uh, knowing how to contribute and participate. Um, you're right, you know, I mean, uh, settlement can mean a lot, lot of different things. I think you were next, yes, go ahead.
I was just going to just but butt in there, and I'm going to open the floor to our, our, um, our speakers also to do that. I think one of the most important things, and I really thank you for what you've brought up, because I think it's a very important point. Um, we all have concerns, and I'm, I'm speaking very much as a, an outsider, well, I'm an outsider to Australia, but um, from observing these concerns in a universal sense, that we don't want to see any community um, abused. It's very important, <coughs> I think, to also to listen to the communities that are here and, and to listen to concerns like this. But one of the things I'd like to really try and encourage us to do too is, if those are real concerns, if we can perhaps dialogue about them, because that's what today's all about, dialogue about those concerns. Let's hear some of the things that maybe that there are, it's general feeling that we haven't heard and perhaps in some way take some steps forward so that we can work um, not to oppose each other, because I think we're all aiming for the same thing. We're all saying that we really want to work together for a community that lives in peace. And at the end of the day, you know, if we haven't heard something or the communities that are present here haven't heard something or someone in the audience has a strong feeling as the feeling that's been presented there, I think it's a really important place to say, okay, what are those things and how can we work together? And um, obviously, you know, we want to make sure that things are authentic and they are authentic, but we also want to make sure that we don't have an overriding cynicism, and I say, say this very much because I've seen this very often, is that sometimes we can become quite cynical about approaches because we've seen one thing go wrong, because there's a lot of really good work that's going on out there as well, and we need to give praise and accolade to people who've actually just put a lot of their heart and soul into doing that, more because that they're so passionate, and I think that's inspiring too. So let's give room for both those things as we go forward in that little conversation. So would you like to answer that? I don't pretend to have the answers, but being Sudanese myself, and also having the same doubt for many years, I then after that accept the services. That's our problem. Because in this country, if you need something, you have to actually find where to get it. When we come first, like when Sudanese come to <coughs> Australia, at the arrival, there are services there. But if they don't trust the social workers, they are not going to access those services. Also, another thing is the boys. If there is no boys in the community, that united boys, and then that community will be pragmatized. And what does happen is that on an individual basis, you go and ask for service if, if you get that service, and you are happy with it. And then that organization, the organization that works with you, I don't believe they are taking an advantage of you, but they are showing the service that they give because what they do is what they show. And if they show what they give to a person, whether a Sudanese or any other newly arrived community, I do believe that's the truth of what they did. That's, that's my way of seeing it. So the truth of what you give, if you have L5 Sudanese people, and in Victoria maybe around 8,000 Sudanese are here or more, I, I'm not sure. But if each organization has five of those, and the other organization has five of those, and the other organization has five of those, and those clients are happy, well, it, it, is, it is up to them to actually showcase what they did. This is what we do, and our clients are happy. So that's one side of, in other way, when you come to the community and look at the community, those numbers doesn't show up, they doesn't add up with, who, with the people who are actually benefiting from service. And so I don't think we can blame organizations, but at some point it is halfway. We can blame ourselves, and also blame the organization in a way that, okay, how can you help us actually have our own boys? For example, look at what happened in the media about three years ago. How many of us actually stand up like Sudanese? We have a lot of people working in organization, but how many of us actually came and united in one voice and go to the Parliament House and stand in front of the Parliament House and say, hey, we are not that, here, what, here is what we are. So there is always that. And if there is a perception in things, and then there is always a struggle. So you have a point, but that point is actually concurrent. It's <coughs> either our problem or social services problem, but most of it is, has to do with us because we have to have that sense of, okay, let's unite and let's see if this is happening, let's come together and see how we will deal with it. And then I think that's, that's where it lies. But so the problem is more to do with us than those who are providing service. Thank I you. I just wanted Thanks, to add Peter. something um, as oh, well. I might just add on the same organisation quickly first. Thanks for raising that point. I think it is a valid thing that all organisations need to really um, look deep inside to see where is the motivation for what they're doing coming from. And that's paramount to any work that any of us do. 
the reality is that funding is a big game and uh, we're all desperate for it. And I'm, I, I'm fully aware that there are many organisations that, that use certain things to manipulate getting as much as they can. Um, but it's up to the integrity of organisations and individuals to, to really hold true to that. And I'd speak on behalf of myself and our organisation that that is, that is true, that we endeavour to do that. And definitely nobody put words in anybody's mouths on that presentation. But um, I guess ways that Spectrum really um, see valuable and, and try and prevent that happening is by employing as many passionate people like Peter, people from the ethnic groups that we are supporting within our organisation and um, yeah, allowing them to work for their own communities and <coughs> for other communities uh, within our area. Um, I'm definitely a, min a min minority in my organisation to be only English speaking, born in Australia, white Anglo-Saxon and to me that's a fantastic um, environment to work in and I'd say that the work of our organisation is, is enhanced almost purely by the staff that represent those um, differing communities. So I think it's a valid point and I think everybody needs to, yeah, look at their own integrity and, and values and be sure not to be doing that. I just wanted to add as well, I think it's actually a valid point because there has been a lot of mistrust between, I guess, people and access to organisations. So it'd be interesting to see why this mistrust is, is occurring and what are organisations doing to respond? Is there a complaint mechanism that you can, you know, if there is an organisation that you feel you, do, you don't trust to access that organisation, how can you complain? Um, because research from Arabic um, speaking background communities has shown that even though there are a lot of um, services out there, there's that lack of tr trust. So I think that it is important for organisations to listen to the consumer or the client as well um, and, and look at that kind of participation that Amy was talking about um, and making that organisation a part of the community so it's sort of not that division either yet. I think we've got one more comment from um, the panel. Yeah, I think it, um, it raises issues um, that Peter brought up as well about voice and representation and I mean if we're asking the question of does a, is a particular project working to help with social cohesion or help with social integration? Um, it's very hard, as many people have said, to measure that quantitatively. The question is, though, when you get into qualitative measurements, what criteria are you going to apply to them? And um, I think by the time you get to an evaluation point and, um, and try to apply qualitative criteria to evaluate a project, it's almost a bit too late. I mean, you, because, I mean, we, from old community development method methodology, if you're taking a community-based project, the question of who it is that constructs the project and who it is that determines the objectives is fundamental. So if you actually have the people who are involved in the project, whether you call them clients or beneficiaries or customers or whatever they are, I mean, if it's, if it's the people themselves that are constructing the objectives of a project, then being able to measure whether or not integration has occurred effectively or whether the service has been delivered effectively is a lot easier because you can just ask them and you can map relationships and you can map progress. But I think when we, um, something that we all face is um, because of the way the grants are structured, we're always tied to producing projects. Um, a colleague of mine in Colombia always said, everyone's happy to fund the islands, but no one wants to fund the continent. So you can't put money into funding a community development worker who is prepared to do the hard yards and walk the streets and, and do all that sort of background work because you need to be able to produce a project that's got really concrete outcomes, measurable outcomes. And if you can produce 10 workshops and have 250 people attend, um, attend an event, then you can sign it off really easily. But what we're talking about, about social integration cohesion, we're talking about social change. And social change is a lot harder to measure. So I think that there's a, um, there's a job at a policy level for changing the way that funding structures are, are constructed so that we have a bit more freedom to be more responsive to the needs of the people that we're working with. And just adding to that before we go on to any other questions, and we do need to finish up shortly because the plenary will be reconvening in five minutes, I would say. 
Um, the other thing too, I think, I mean, that was an excellent question and I think a very thought provoking one and topical. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the other issue too is, um, you know, there's that tension between well-established um, organisations that attract funding because they've got a track record and, 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 and they're, they're able to deliver and it's very hard for newer and emerging communities um, who don't have the track record, don't have the, 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 the uh, sort of organisational set up um, that government has the confidence to, to fund. The other option though I think, and the, you know, the door is open for this as well, uh, uh, and that is whether we're talking about a migrant resource centre such as Spectrum or any of the other agencies, there is always the option for standing for election to the board of directors and making sure your community is represented. It might be the Ethnic Communities Council, it might be you know, one of the MRCs, but um, uh, if you get into that um, uh, uh, stream of um, being a player, being a participant, engaging, contributing to how that organisation is run, uh, uh, what its priorities are, what its culture is as a, as a corporate you know, agency, then uh, on behalf of your community, you can influence the direction that that organisation takes. And I think, I think that's the encouragement to a lot of the more, recent, the more recently arrived refugee and migrant communities to actually um, uh, um, play that game of um, you know, getting into um, uh, uh, the community politics, if you like, of organisations like migrant resource centres and similar organisations on, on behalf of your own communities. All right, look, I think we've probably only got time for one more question. Who would like to ask the last question? Over here. still aren't enough to stop the problems that are coming your way? Like, do you feel like there's a deeper root to the problems that you're trying to heal? And, um, and I mean primarily political problems that are happening overseas. Do you feel like you have the resources or the access to do something about that? Be it to lobby politicians or to influence media or something like that? Who's going to go first? Okay. Um, I think often in this whole sector, we do feel like it's it's bigger than what we can handle and what we can take. And when we think of the world and the situation the whole world's in, you know, that's exactly the same. And the I guess the the people that we are seeing for in our service have experienced so much trauma and um, displacement and you know, separation from family and, you know, witnessing um, awful situations that all of those things come with them to this new environment and it's not at all easy to, to you know, to bridge that gap and to move in and settle as, as we were talking about before. Um, so, of course, those things are far greater than, than things, that, <coughs> things that, we, that we can solve um, entirely and... Um, I guess what we try and do is to, um, and I, especially with this mixing of cultures, is it's, it's allowing people to share the experiences that they've had across cultures that definitely I have experienced nothing of the sort of in my upbringing here in Australia. And there's so much value in them being able to share um, things that they have in, in common. Um, and I guess you're grabbing onto things like that that um, can bring such positive um, yeah, outcomes. Amidst, amidst problems that are far greater than, than you could ever resolve. That's a start. No, of course not. We d I mean, we don't have access to deal entirely with the root of the problem, but we do use media as best, as best we can. We do um, advocate <coughs> as best we can um, for, the young, for the people that we're working with. And in mainstream schools, in mainstream organisations, um, doing our best to inform and educate and advocate for the people that we're working with. And we do our best with the resources that we've got, um, which, yeah, which are not enough, I suppose. 
think yeah. we, might, we might just do one last question, but I think that, that, that's a very difficult question. You know, there's a whole lot of issues about the capacity of community sector agencies like MRCs. The funding is very fragmented. It's short term. You can't do longer term planning and so on and so forth. And it, I think it goes back to that gentleman's first question about the need for a broader evaluation so we can, you know, I in a more rigorous way, assess where we're at. Now, have we got time for one more question? We don't think so? Okay, very quickly. Um, um, I forgot to mention as well, um, coming up in October, we have our Northern Tracks show, which is part of our anti-racism action band, which is in short Arab. Um, and Arab is made up of about 250 young people. They're bringing broad meadows to the city. What that means is they're trying to um, challenge suburban stereotypes and they're going to be dancing and having rap, hip hop, stand up comedian, a diverse diverse array of performance acts in the city, in feder um, around Federation Square, Flinders Street Station, looking at violence also um, in public transport on the trains and stuff like that. That's why it's called Northern Tracks. So I'm just gonna put it um, over, the, over on the table here and you, can, and you can get it. And if you wanted to book a ticket, it's $5. Um, but some of the shows are also for free. So it's really good to check out what young people are trying to do and trying to um, look at Ch ch um, tackling social issues through performing arts.